Well, I already told you this morning we're going to look at the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to look from the time he's crucified to his death, and because the text is so lengthy, we're going to look at what happens from his, his death to his uh, burial this evening. So this morning I'd like to read for you that section we're going to be uh, looking at, and that would be in verses 17 through verse 30. So John chapter 19, verses 17 through 30, and would you pay careful attention to this? This isn't just, uh, it, it is the words of an eyewitness, and they are 100% the words of John, but they are also exactly what our Lord intended, be written down for us so that we might know what happened so many years later. So this is 100% the Word of God. This is what John writes. They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two other men, one on either side and Jesus in between. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, they divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots." Therefore the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the, uh, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour the disciple took her into his own household. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished, to fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. May the Lord again bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, last week uh, we noted that Jesus was willing to suffer at the hands of his own people for us. They condemned him, his own people, the leaders of Israel, in their own court for blasphemy and realizing that that charge would not stick with the Romans, charged him before the Roman court with treason. We saw his willingness to suffer at the hands of Pilate for us because Pilate, of course, realizing that he was innocent, yet still tried to get Jesus off the hook. He had Jesus scourged, thinking that would satisfy them, but it didn't. He publicly humiliated Jesus by having his soldiers treat him as some sort of a mock king, but that didn't satisfy them. And finally, he condemned him to death, even though he knew Jesus was an innocent man. And he did that in order to save his own position of authority as governor of Rome because the Jews, as you know, threatened to turn him into Caesar if he let Jesus off the hook. Well, Jesus was willing to submit to this. He was willing to submit to this mistreatment for us because he loves us, because he knew the Father chose us and gave us to Him as His reward. Jesus was willing to do this for us because He knew this was the only way that He could save us. He had to offer a payment that was sufficient, that was enough to pay for our sins. 
And our sins were infinite sins committed against an infinitely holy God and only one who was infinitely worthy could possibly pay for them. Jesus is the only one who could save us and he was willing to do that. Now we also saw that this mistreatment at the hands of, the, of his own people and of the Romans was God's plan all along. Jesus had to be condemned. Jesus had to die. And we saw that it could not be by the hand of the Jews. The Jews stoned their victims to death. It had to be by the Romans. He had to be lifted up on a cross. Jesus said if he was lifted up, he would draw all men to himself. Those whom the Father had given him from every nation under heaven. Well, we saw Jesus was condemned. He was condemned to be crucified. And we come now to his execution at the hands of the Romans. Now, again, I told you how I'm going to divide this text because there's really too much to look at in, in just one sermon. So we're going to look at the crucifixion to his death and from his death then to his burial this evening. But this morning, I want us to see seven things from our text. I want us to see the place of his crucifixion, his company in crucifixion, the charge against him that really led to his crucifixion, his possessions gambled for in his crucifixion, his care for his mother in crucifixion, his bearing God's wrath for our sins in crucifixion, and finally his death in the crucifixion. So first of all, let's consider the place of his crucifixion. We read about it in verse 17. They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. Now, I want you to notice first what we noted earlier as we were looking at Genesis chapter 22, that Jesus carried his own cross. Now, we do know from other gospel accounts that Jesus carried his cross at least part of the way to the crucifixion, but then his strength began to fail. And when that happened, they actually pressed another man by the name of Simon the Cyrene into carrying his cross. But it was important that Jesus carry it from the beginning to fulfill the type that we read about uh, that he had given us in Isaac so many years earlier. Now, as we read earlier, when Abraham was called by God to sacrifice his son on Mount Moriah, he placed the wood of, of, for the sacrifice on Isaac's back and let him carry it up the mount. I've already told you, Isaac's sacrifice was a picture of what Jesus would do years later when he would carry the wood for his sacrifice up the mount to the place of his execution. Now, as we read in our text, this place was called the place of a skull. It's interesting, in Greek, it's, it's, the Greek word is cranion from which we get the word cranium, which as you know is basically the, the, the skull. In Latin, it's called calvaria, from which we get the word calvary, and in Hebrew, it's called Golgotha, all which mean skull. Now, I don't know if you understood this, but calvary, you know, we think about calvary. Calvary, we think of a mount, but calvary literally means skull. And those churches, Calvary Church, Calvary Chapel, are actually skull chapel and skull church. <laughs> Couldn't, couldn't resist. But of course, we don't remember it because of, of that. We remember it because of what happened. <laughs> what happened there? Okay. Now, it's called by these names because the side of that particular hill, and it still remains today, looks like a human skull. And apparently, it was a very well-known place, which is why the evangelists pointed out, a place very near the city so that everybody who lived in Jerusalem could very easily see Jesus crucified there. But here it was a place that reminds us of death. I mean, every time somebody looked at that hill, they'd say, oh, there's the skull. It would remind them of death, and here was the place where our Lord Jesus would give up his life. Now, secondly, we see his company in crucifixion. We read about this in verse 18. There they crucified him. And with him, two other men, one on either side and Jesus in between. Now, when they arrived at Golgotha, they crucified Jesus. And as you know, crucifixion 
is a form of capital punishment, the form used by the Romans, and in this particular, um, uh, well, execution. The victim was either tied to a cross or he was nailed to a cross and then he was left to hang there for several days until he either died from basically uh, uh, exhaustion and dehydration or he died from suffocation when he could no longer basically hold himself up. Now, in Jesus' case, nails were used. We know that. Peter preached on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, verse 23. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Now, you can only imagine, or we can only imagine what that would feel like. And actually, the nails through the feet, the nails through the hand, was not the most painful part of the crucifixion. It was having to hang there for such a long time until you literally dried up or suffocated. It would be hard enough just to stand in that position, but to be hanging in that position, an excruciating death. But as we already know, that was not the worst part of it. The worst part was yet to come. Now, there were two others who were crucified with him. As we saw last time, they were insurrectionists. Like Barabbas, who likely were arrested in the same insurrection as Barabbas. The Jewish leaders had convinced the people to ask for Barabbas' freedom instead of Jesus. And so now they were taking Jesus to the cross and crucifying him on the cross that was meant for Barabbas between the two men who had actually committed the same crime as Barabbas. Now, one thing we need to notice in this is that as in both of these things, Jesus' crucifixion fulfilled what He had had said by His Spirit so many years ago through the prophets. David wrote in Psalm 22, verse 16, which we read for our call to worship, For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Uh, One thing I just want you to note right here is that this piercing... Actually, we're going to see a little bit more about this this evening, but the word, the, the word here for piercing is actually a word that talks about a very uh, small hole, like the kind that you would uh, drive in with an awl, versus a larger thrusting kind of piercing, which is what they will do to Jesus when he, after he's died on the cross and the soldier will take his spear and pierce him. So here we see the fulfillment of this particular prophecy regarding Christ. They pierced my hands and my feet. And Isaiah writes in Isaiah 53, 12, Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. So here we see two things. Jesus' hands and his feet were pierced as he was surrounded by his enemies and they put him to death. Secondly, he was numbered with the transgressors. He was crucified between two criminals. Now again, this not only shows us that the Bible is God's word since God alone can tell us the future. It again reminds us of what Jesus is willing to go through because of his love for us that he would be willing to be considered a a criminal, that he would be executed for a crime which he didn't commit, between two in the company of two who actually did deserve to die. Jesus was willing to go through these things because of his love for us. This is not a small thing. It's multiplied beyond comprehension as we consider who this one was that was willing to do this. Now, thirdly, we see the charge against him in the crucifixion. We read in verses 19 through 22, Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. 
Now, this inscription was the charge that Jesus had been found guilty of, that for which he was being crucified. He was the king of the Jews. And it was written in three languages. It was written in Hebrew, which is the language, as you know, of Israel, the language of the Jews. It was written in Latin, which is the language of the Romans. And it was written, written in Greek, which is basically the common language of the people, so that whoever passed by would be able to see the charge that this man had been charged with. Now, when the Jews saw it, of course, they were offended and they immediately wanted it to be changed. Don't write, he is the king of the Jews, but that he claimed to be the king of the Jews. Now, as you know, Pilate by now wasn't the least bit inclined to give in to them since they had forced him to crucify Jesus, whom he knew was an innocent man, and he knew they were crucifying him because they envied him and his, basically his influence with the people. Pilate meant this to be an insult against the Jews as repayment for their threats, and so he left it as, he, as it was, not because he thought Jesus was the king of the Jews, but because he knew the Jewish leaders did not want him to write that. And so he says, what I have written, I have written. But let's not forget that what Pilate wrote, even though he may not have believed it and those Jewish leaders didn't believe it, was actually true. Jesus is their king. Jesus came to his own people. They rejected him. He is the Christ, the Messiah, the one they had been waiting for for all these years, the one that God sent into the world to save them. And yet, when he came, they hated him and put him to death. John tells us that that was what was going to happen at the end of the story, at the end of his gospel, even at the beginning where he writes in John 1.11, he came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. This is the way his own people treated him. They rejected him. Now again, just as a reminder to us, if the world treated Jesus like this, and, and these Jewish leaders were of the world, they may have been in the Old Testament church, they may have been the leaders of, of the church, they may have been the teachers of Israel, the leaders of Israel. Jesus even said, they sit in the seat of Moses and you should listen to them, to his people, because they had this position, yet they were still in the world. It's possible to be in the church, but to still be in the world, and that's true even of today. We need to make sure that we love Jesus and not hate him the way the, these Jewish leaders did. But again, notice how the world treated Jesus. Jesus has told us on more than one occasion in his word that if they treated him this way, then we should expect the same kind of treatment and that this is the price we must be willing to pay in order to follow him, even as Jesus was willing to pay it for us in order that he might save us because he loves us. Now, fourthly, we see his possessions gambled for in the crucifixion. We read in verses 23 through 25. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Now those who did the work of crucifying these particular victims had the right to plunder their victims. After all, dead men no longer need their possessions. It basically says that they stripped Jesus of his clothing. You know, we, out of modesty, whenever you see, and, and really, I, I believe that we're not to see Jesus necessarily on the cross because he's, he's not on the cross anymore. Uh, in, in certain denominations, it seems to be in vogue to have Jesus hanging on the cross. And when you see him hanging on the cross, he has at least a loincloth on, and that's for modesty, but I think perhaps what actually happened was they stripped all of his clothes off of him, and he was basically crucified naked, which would be a very shameful thing. I mean, just picture, would you want to be, you know, to have that done to you? Of course not. 
Well, they took these garments of Jesus and they divided them amongst themselves as basically a little bit more of a recompense, as it were, for the work that they had done. But when they came to the tunic, they saw that it was seamless. It was woven in one place, which is something, if any of you are, you know, actually have ever woven a, a, a garment, that would take a lot of time to do and a great deal of skill. So it made this particular uh, item of clothing valuable. It's possible that one of the wealthy women that, that Luke tells us about that followed and supported Jesus may have given it to him out of her love for him. So anyway, the soldiers seeing this valuable piece of uh, clothing said, let's not tear it, but let's instead gamble for it to see who would have it. And as they gambled for the tunic of our Lord Jesus Christ, they fulfilled. Again, what David wrote in Psalm twenty-two, eighteen: they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing, they cast lots. Now, let me just remind you, that was written hundreds of years before this event ever took place. And we, we know that that text existed in that time frame, and we know the New Testament was written in the time frame it was written, and that Jesus, humanly speaking, had no control over the things that were happening to Him when He was on the cross. He gave Himself over into their hands to die at their hands, and yet these things were being done outside of His control, at least humanly speaking. Divinely speaking, it was all in His hands. Now, this wasn't collusion on the part of Jesus or His disciples. They had no control over this either. God was fulfilling everything that He had promised in order to bring us life through the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. All these fulfillments of prophecy are the way of, of the Lord identifying that this is the one He was pointing to throughout the entirety of the Old Testament. This is Him, and He's dying just as I said He would die. He's laying down His life so that He might bring you life. That's how our Lord identifies Him. He doesn't point down from heaven, and as the word of the hand comes and points to, this is my Son. He had already done that on another occasion where He said from the heavens, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. But in this case, look at the Scripture and see what's happening and know that this is that one. He is the Messiah, the only one who can bring life. Now, one other thing I thought was interesting is notice at the end of his life how little our Lord actually possessed as far as worldly possessions. Just the clothes on his back, everything that the soldiers were gambling for, that's all that he had, showing us that Jesus actually did practice what it is he preached. And that is that we're, if we have food and covering, and what he means by covering is not necessarily a house, but if we have the clothes on our back, we should be content. If we could only learn from his example and be content with the same, we could avoid so many of the world's snares and better be able to advance the Lord's kingdom. I mean, Paul commends this to us as well in 1 Timothy 6, verses 8 through 10, where he writes this, if we have food and covering. With these we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I mean, isn't that true? And isn't it true that the people who have most of what the world has to offer are the ones who shipwreck their lives most often. They, they trash them, they destroy them because these things are a snare. They are not to be the things that we are seeking after, but rather to seek after what our Lord sought after, to serve His Lord, to serve His God, and to honor Him by loving Him and loving His neighbor. Now, fifthly, we see His care for His mother in the crucifixion. We, we read in verses 25 through 27, but standing by the cross of Jesus were His mother and His mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus then saw His mother and the disciple whom He loved standing nearby, He said to His mother, woman, behold your son. 
Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. Now here we see three women standing near the cross. Interestingly, all three of their names were Mary. I don't know if you noticed that. There was Mary, his mother. Mary, the wife of Clopas. His mother's sister. Uh, More likely, this was Mary's sister-in-law or Joseph's sister because it's really unlikely that Mary's parents would have named two of their daughters Mary. Every time you call for Mary, then they say, which Mary do you want, right? Well, we know as parents that wouldn't be very practical, and and generally we don't see that in Scripture either, okay? So it's probably Joseph's um, sister. And then, of course, Mary Magdalene, the one that Jesus had delivered from seven demons. Note that only one of the disciples is there. All the rest of them were still in hiding. And yet these women were there standing near the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, maybe they did this because they, well, actually they were walking around with Jesus all the time too, weren't they? Maybe they thought they wouldn't be recognized or maybe their love for their Lord was much stronger than their fear of man. And that's, of course, what the Lord desires. Well, when Jesus saw his mother and he saw John, the disciple whom he loved, he said to Mary, woman, behold your son. And he wasn't saying, Mary, look at me. But he was saying, Mary, look at John, because John is now your son. He is the one who is now going to take care of you. Because Jesus realized that his relationship with his mother was now changing. It was now coming to an end. He wasn't going to be there any longer to take care of her. And so he points to John as the one who would now be a son to her. And he also said to John, behold your mother, to indicate to John his will that he now should care for her. Now we do know that Mary had other children. And we might wonder why did Jesus give the care of his mother into the hand of his disciple when there are still these several other brothers? Well, I think the answer is that Jesus wanted her to be cared for by somebody that belonged to him, and it's quite possible that perhaps the brothers were not yet in that position. Or perhaps he was simply indicating, well, John, you're the only one who's here that belongs to my disciples, but I want all of my people to care for one another as though they are family. Perhaps Jesus was simply indicating that, but John took her into his own household from that day, and he cared for her. But notice this, Jesus was on the cross when he said this. He was undergoing the excruciating pain of crucifixion, and yet in the midst of that, he wasn't thinking about his needs, but he was concerned for his mother, that she be cared for. And again, Jesus on the cross giving us a perfect example of what it means to serve one another. It means to lay aside our own desires and to lay aside even our own needs. I mean, Jesus had needs on the cross, but He laid those all aside to minister to the needs of others. That's what Jesus calls us to do. And let's just remember that in case we think that we would lose out by doing, actually doing what Jesus calls us to do, by actually following this example, we do need to remember what our Lord Jesus said on another occasion in Mark 9, verse 35. If anyone wants to be first, he should be last of all and servant of all. When Jesus said of John the Baptist, of, of all, the, uh, all of those who have been born of woman, there has not been re- uh, anyone who has basically come into the world greater than John the Baptist, and yet he who is least in the kingdom is greater than he. I don't think Jesus was saying that everybody in the kingdom that humbles himself is going to be greater than John, but I think what he was saying was he who is the least in the kingdom himself. And here we see that again. He's the one who humbled himself to the position of servant to all of his disciples. And even on the cross, we see him continuing to serve his disciples and even his mother. He is the one who is the greatest, and that's, the, that's why he was exalted to the position that he is in, to the, the name which is above every name, so that every knee would bow. Now, Jesus tells us that if we want to be ministered to, if we want to be exalted, if we want to be first, then we need to do what Jesus did 
We need to become the servant of all. There's really no better way to minister to our, our own needs than by ministering to the needs of others. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And every time we do that, we actually discover that what Jesus said is true. When we can set aside what it is we want to do and do what somebody else needs for us to do for them, we are blessed by the Lord. Again, Jesus gives us the best example. Now, sixth, we see His bearing God's wrath for our sins in crucifixion. And here I'm going to have to draw on another gospel because John doesn't record uh, what we see here. But in Matthew 27, verses 45 through 47, we read this. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who were standing there when they heard it began saying, this man is calling for Elijah. Now, as already noted, John didn't record the words of our Lord here, but we, we believe that it was at this time that the Father laid our sins upon Jesus Christ and he became estranged or alienated from his Father, at least with regard to his human nature, and that he experienced his Father's full wrath. It's believed that the sky was darkened so that we wouldn't see, as it were, the agony that the Son was going through because Jesus literally went through hell on the cross. Now, we do need to understand that Jesus, when he died on the cross, when he was suffering on the cross, that is when he underwent hell. He didn't die and then go down into the depths of the earth. Sometimes scriptures are interpreted that way. When it says that he uh, descended, it basically means he came into the world. When it says that he went, he would be in the depths of the earth for three days and three nights, it means he was going to be in the tomb, not that he would be down into the depths of hell. Jesus says at the end of his crucifixion, it is finished, into your hands I commit my spirit. He was commending his soul to God to go in, to be with the Lord in paradise. He didn't descend into hell. This is where he suffered hell, was when he was on the cross. And that's also what the Father was trying to point out to the Jews that were looking on was the fact that it was on the cross that he became accursed. He was nailed to the tree to show us that he was under the curse of God, that he was bearing the curse that Adam's sin had actually brought on us. Paul writes this in Galatians 3, verses 13 through 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Jesus didn't just symbolically become a curse for us on the cross. He became literally a curse for us on the cross. When our sins were laid upon Him, He was cursed, basically, under God's covenant. He became a curse for us. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. But once our sins were laid upon Jesus and He became a curse and fell under that curse, the Father's face of wrath was faced fully towards Jesus. And He suffered the full wrath of God, the full brunt of that wrath. Now let me just remind you, that's why when Jesus was praying in the garden and He looks forward into that furnace of fire, basically into hell, God's wrath on the cross, that's why He began to sweat blood in the garden. That's why his sweat was mingled with blood. That's why he was under such duress, was because of this, not because of the scourging, not because of the mocking, not because even of the crucifixion, but because he would have to face God's wrath on the cross. Now, this is another reason why Jesus actually had to be God as well as man in order to save us. He had to be God to give value to that sacrifice so that he could pay for the magnitude of, of the depths of our sins. I mean, we sinned against an infinitely holy God. 
And the only payment that could pay for that would be infinite, and only a God-man could pay for that. But who could survive the full wrath of God once it's turned on you? Only a God-man could do this and survive. Only a God-man, through his sufferings, could actually satisfy that debt. This is the only way that our sins could be paid for, and so obviously the only way they could ever be paid was through Jesus, because he's the only one who has ever been both God and man. He had to be God to survive this. He had to be God in order to give value to it. He had to be man so that he could make the payment on our side and so that he could die. God cannot die, but a man can die. Jesus was the only one who could do it for those reasons, and he did on the cross, and he did it willingly. Remember, he gave himself willingly into the hands of his enemies. He submitted to all of this for us because he loves us. Now, finally, we see his death in crucifixion. The soul that sins shall die. The wages of sin is death. If our sins are to be paid for, somebody has to die. And only Jesus could do it, so he had to die. We read in John 19, verses 28 through 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the Scripture, said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine or vinegar was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now again, this was also to fulfill prophecy. David writes in Psalm 69, verse 21, They also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. You know, it's interesting that at the, at the beginning of the crucifixion, one of the other gospel writers said that before he was crucified, they offered him gall, basically mixed with vinegar, and he refused it because he was... He wanted to be lucid on the cross. He wanted to have his full wits about him. It was meant to take the edge off the pain and to dull the senses and so forth. So they gave me gall for my food. And just before he dies, they lift up the sponge full of vinegar. And for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Again, Jesus, all these things being fulfilled on him, God's pointing to him, saying, look, here is my son. And he's giving his life. Here is what? Everything that I have told you is pointing to. Here is your Redeemer. Trust in Him. After they gave Him the vinegar, this was the last thing that needed to be done to Him, and He said, it is finished. The work was now complete. Scripture was fulfilled. He had already borne the wrath of God for our sins, and basically, now that was over. Jesus bows His head, and He gives up His spirit. Now, we need to understand that when Jesus did that, the sacrifice was complete. Uh, in the other gospel writers, the, ta- the veil of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom, the earthquake, some of the dead were raised. I mean, there were a lot of things that were going on at this particular time. But the fact that the Lord tore the veil means that the Old Testament system was now defunct. It was fulfilled and now abolished. Those sacrifices would no longer do. You you didn't have to approach God now through an animal sacrifice. Now you approach Him through the sacrifice of His Son. Jesus gave up His spirit. By the way, that's His human soul. And I do want you to, to, to notice that Jesus gave it willingly. He gave up His life. He surrendered it. He gave it up for our sins. When they are going to come to him a little bit later, Pilate's going to be surprised by the fact that Jesus was already dead. The other men weren't dead. Why was Jesus already dead? Well, it's not because the crucifixion killed him. It's because he willingly laid down his life. He yielded up his spirit. He bowed his head and simply gave it up. Jesus willingly paid the price. He he gave up his life because that was the price that was required to pay for our sins. And he was willing to do that because of love, so that you and I might live, so that he might rescue us from hell, from what he endured. And by the way, those few moments that he endured hell on the cross, and it could have been the three hours or it could have been a shorter period of time, we don't know exactly how long it was. 
But He can do in those few moments what we could not do through an eternity of suffering. He could satisfy God's justice because of His personal worth, but we could never satisfy God's justice for justly being punished for our sins throughout eternity. Jesus willingly gave up His life to rescue us from something that we could have never saved ourselves from. And now Jesus exercises His right and His claim over you, and He calls you to give up your life for Him in the same way that He gave His life for you. And that's, again, of course, what the table reminds us of. So let me just close this portion of, of the sermon by asking you this question. Have you done that this morning? Have you given up your life to Him? Everybody who comes to Jesus comes to Him on His terms. You don't come to Jesus on your own terms. You don't write the contract and say, this is what I'm willing to do, Lord, and this is all I'm willing to do. I realize you want this, but this is what I'm going to give you. Jesus says, no, you can't come. You have to be willing to come on my terms, Jesus says. And, and what are His terms? Well, He says you have to trust Him and trust Him alone and not your own righteousness, not your own works, but His works alone. And His sacrifice to forgive your sins, but you also need to be willing to lay down your life, to pick up your cross, to follow after Him, to actually read His words, try to understand what it says to the best of your ability, and then to live it. Not to get yourself into heaven, but because He's already opened the door for you and has, has given you this promise that He's going to bring you to heaven. You're doing it because of what He's done for you, because of the love that He has for you and the love that you now have for Him. That's the reason why you do these things, not so you can earn your ticket to heaven so that God can put His stamp on it eventually and say, you've done enough, now I'm going to let you in. You can never do enough. Your works are filthy rags, what Isaiah says. Paul looked at all of his works in his own righteousness. He said, this mound of dung that I have, I leave it behind. That's what I count it as now. I don't look to that for my salvation. I look to Jesus and what He has done. So no, we're not trying to work our way into heaven, but we're doing this now because we love Him and because we're, you know, we're thankful for what He's done. And we want to do what, he's, what He wants us to do because that's in our heart to do. He's changed our hearts by His Holy Spirit. Jesus laid down His life because He loved the Father and wanted to serve Him and He wanted to save us. He did it out of love and now our Lord calls us to lay down our lives in love to Him. Of course, you need the Spirit of God to show you that is real that He really exists, that He really is seated at the right hand of God, that one day you really are going to stand before Him, one, that, that He really has saved you by His life from this burning hell, which is also real. But the Spirit of God gives you the faith to see those things as well. So again, the question is, have you seen those things? And have you responded to Jesus' call this morning? Well, if not, that's what Jesus calls you to do. And let me just remind you, you have nothing to lose by receiving the Lord Jesus Christ except hell and eternity in hell and the things that are in this world that would be a snare to your soul, yeah, you lose those things, but look at what you gain. You gain an eternity with the Lord. You gain heaven. You gain your life. You gain your safety. You get to be in a world which is so satisfying that really the, the, the moments on earth when we've experienced the greatest joy that we've ever experienced is just a shadow of what it's like in heaven where our hearts are full all the time with satisfaction and joy and happiness and love in a way that it's really hard to conceive. But if we, if we are the Lord's, we've seen a glimpse of what it is we're going to see in heaven. We've had a taste of what heaven is like, but there we get the full, the full inheritance. We get that, that full immersion into that world. So we have nothing to lose but hell and we have heaven to gain. So if you haven't given yourself to Jesus, give yourself to Him now, follow Him now, love Him and serve Him now, and the Lord will bless you even now and give you that experience of His love as that down payment. 
as you look forward to what he has for you in heaven. Now this evening, we're going to consider what happens after his death to his burial. But for now, let's follow on from this to come to the table. And I hopefully you've been preparing to come to the table because we've been looking at the death of our Lord Jesus Christ and all that, it's, all that He did for us, all that He gave up for us, all that He suffered for us. And that's what the table is meant to remind us of. But if we are to come to the table, we do have to be those who have responded to Jesus Christ. We have to be those who trust Him. We have to be those who love Him. We have to be those who are following Him who are actually, again, reading His Word and doing what He says, not just avoiding what He says to avoid, but doing what He says to do, confessing Him before the world, confessing Him before our friends, our neighbors who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, telling them about what Jesus Christ has done. We have to be those who are like Jesus, and again, not perfectly like Him because none of us are. We all fall short in many ways. But we must be striving to be like Jesus and going beyond just wanting to be like Him but actually living like our Lord Jesus Christ. If that describes you, then our Lord says, come to the table and I will meet you there and I will strengthen you and I will give you grace to help you continue to do what you're already doing, which is loving me, Jesus says. But if you don't love me, Jesus says, don't, don't come to the table because that would be hypocritical. That would be hypocrisy to remember the death of Christ and His love for you and yet respond in a way that's really hating Him, still in rebellion against Him. You need to love Jesus. Be willing to serve Him. Be willing to do whatever He calls you to do when you come to the table. If that's your desire and you see that happening in your life, come. And the Lord will give you even greater grace to do His will. Well, let's bow and let's spend a few moments in, in prayer. Let's ask the Lord to help us uh, search our hearts, examine our lives, repent of our sins, and then come to the table.